This is the Serial and Midnight Podcast. Howdy guys, welcome to the Serial at Midnight Podcast. My name is Heath Holland and you know I'm excited about this one because I'm talking to Jason and Sean Mendelson. They are the sons of Lee Mendelson, a name that we all know from the Charlie Brown, the Peanuts uh, holiday specials. So much more than the holiday specials, but we're specifically talking about one of the holiday specials in this episode. It's the 50th anniversary of a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. And to commemorate the occasion, we are getting something that we have never had before. A Charlie Brown Thanksgiving soundtrack, 50th anniversary edition. There's a vinyl edition, a record. There's a CD. There's a digital version. And it's not just the music from the special that we all love. Little Birdie. By the way, who's saying that? We find out in this interview. Uh, There is the music that we all know and love, right? This is so much more than that because what you learn and what you're going to hear about in this conversation is like in the specials itself, the special of Charlie Brown Thanksgiving and all the others, the music is so far pushed to the back. It's been leveled so that the drums aren't very loud. You don't hear bass really at all. But this is Vince Guaraldi, jazz legend Vince Guaraldi, who wrote the Peanuts theme, who wrote all this music that we're still talking about 50 years and beyond in the case of like, you know, Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, more than 50 years, this music has been rooted in our culture. So recently, we're going to hear this story, but I'm kind of queuing it up. I'm teasing you a little bit because I want you to get excited about it. Uh, the, the master tapes were recently discovered for this session and other sessions too. So what does that mean? It means we get to hear this music mixed in a way like we've never heard before. So the, the drums are no longer down at like a two out of 10. Now the drums are level with everything else. The bass is level with everything else. The clavicle, you know, we talk like in, in his liner notes, Sean, uh, who's got such a, a, a music background associated with music foundations, music education. Uh, he talks in his liner notes about how Stevie Wonder had had a hit, you know, the clavicle, like superstition on the clavicle. That, you know, that machine, that, that keyboard instrument. So Goraldi brings it into the studio and he, he's, here's what we need to know. So Vince Goraldi was getting a little bit older at the time of a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. So he taps young funk and jazz musicians from the Bay Area to be his band. And so it brings out a whole different dynamic. This soundtrack sounds nothing like any other Charlie Brown soundtrack. It's funky, man. It is so funky. And especially now that we get to hear it like it was recorded. You know I'm a music nerd. I'm such a music fan. This blows my mind. Just to picture picture me with my wife. Go, listen to this. Listen listen to the bass. Listen to how how funky that, that, that tasty that bass jam is. That's how excited I got about this stuff. So we get to hear the whole inside story. Uh, Jason is an Emmy winner and the CEO of the company that's that's preserving the legacy of his father and all of these Charlie Brown specials and the the, the many Charlie Brown specials specials across the decades. Uh, and uh, and Sean is again a music. He's so deeply rooted in music and music education. This is a huge get for Serial at Midnight that they would come here talk about the soundtrack, discovering it, what they did with it, the legacy of it. This is huge. So uh, I'm excited about it. I want you to hear it. I can't wait for you to hear it. So hey, without further ado, Jason and Sean Mendelson. First, so I, uh, last week, I interviewed uh, Mark Evanier, who worked oh, on- Oh, fantastic. So he was, <laughs> it was, it was before we got started with the interview and he was like, uh, Lee Mendelson was great. And I was like, it's funny that you bring that up because I have an opportunity to- <laughs> His sons, and he was like, you tell them that Mark Evanier said that Lee Mendelson is one of the best people I ever worked with. Well, so that's fantastic. For a long period there in the 90s, maybe even earlier than that, whenever we'd go down to LA, because we were big into comic books too. And so whenever we'd go down, we'd beg our father to take us over to Mark's because he has this amazing collection. And we get to see all his comic books and we get to hang out with him. He When I used to host comic-con events and MC them he would teach he's like take the water bottles off the stage before you go up there so they get off so you can get on he trained me on all things related to everything about that and has been a friend for my whole life and he was the great he is the greatest writer and he did all the Garfield stuff and he, so the feeling is the, incredibly the, the funniest <laughs> the funniest uh, guy I think we ever came encounter with uh in our in our dad's professional career he was always very funny and very endearing. So I'm glad you got to meet him. 
He's oh, great. Yeah. I admire him so much just because even if we just looked at like the animation work alone, what he's achieved, but then you look at comics and you look at stuff he did with Jack okay. Kirby and like the, oh, yeah. the preservation of everything, like telling the story being, so I told him, I was like, you know, you're kind of like an archivist. You're kind of like the, yes. the keeper of the, like he's telling the story. He's keeping the story alive. He's like a connection between audiences now and what happened 50 years ago. Yep. And he knows all the people, all the voice actors, all the animators, all the, everybody involved and all the comic strip guys and all the cartoonists and, yeah, he's the best. So, yeah. And our other thing we'll tell you in advance is where our uncle is Eddie Muller, who's the czar of noir. So you got that front as well. It's our is mom's he brother. really? I didn't know yes. that. Yeah. So he's, you know, he is, we, we have lots of um, stewards of history in our circle here. And now we're hoping to be, do some of that ourselves. So that's awesome. Well, so, okay. So here, that opens the door for my question. This is the big Oprah question. Okay. So we know what we know what the Charlie Brown, what the peanut specials mean in the music, what it means to so many different people across multiple generations. You guys came up on the inside of that. So I wonder if you have the same kind of experience. I mean, Jason, you, you did voices, right? I mean, you're actually in some of these things. Are you able to see them the way other people see them? I'll go first. I I think that I am because the great thing about peanuts is that it's for everybody. It, it goes across all the generations, all ideologies. It's really just about children trying to find their place in the world. And as a child who got to play some of the characters and Sean did too, we both got to voice some of the characters. It was really easy to perform those lines because you could empathize with them. You could understand what these kids were going through and the, you know, growing up with it, it's it's funny because for us, Charles Schultz was one of our dad's best friends and they happened to work together. But whenever we were together, it would either be going to his ice rink in Santa Rosa or playing tennis or just talking about life. And then they would put these great shows together. And then, you know, Schultz would write a show and then. Uh, Bill Melendez would go and animate it. And then once that was starting, we would go off with our dad and record some of the voices for these lines. But the disconnect was it's all done over a long period of time. And our part as children as voice actors is done in a recording studio away from all of that. So we didn't see it till it was done. And that might be six months, seven, eight months later that you'd see it on TV. And again, because we were from Northern California, nobody cared. Like nobody cared that we did these things or that yeah. this was part of our life. It was just, you know, it was weird that I couldn't go to parties on the weekend because I was recording voices. But for the most part, it was just part of what we did. And and I'll tell you that the great thing for us, and I'll let Sean throw some his experiences in here too, was when I was about 10 years old, I'd already done some of the voices. My dad was doing the first ever animated miniseries. This is America, Charlie Brown, which is an eight part miniseries with the characters. And we spent the summer before that was put together going to the Smithsonian and all the different museums and all the different American historical places to do research for these characters. And like everything with Charlie Brown, one of the great things, one of the serendipitous things that happened is we walked into the museum, the American History Museum in D.C., and on the wall was a the picture blown up strip of Lucy holding the football for Charlie Brown. And we were like, did you know we were coming? They're like, no, this is just what we're doing. So everywhere you go, Charlie Brown was always omnipresent and part of the culture. And so on all the different fronts, including now with the space program continuing its 50 plus year uh, NASA relationship with Charlie Brown, it's always been a thrill to be part of that. But it was never a um, it was never anything more than what we were doing and what our family had been doing from long before our time. And, and the best thing, you know, Vince Guaraldi passed before before we were born. But we've grown up with that music all the time and especially around the holidays, but even more so it's been part of our lives forever. And then I'll get into how we found it and what was so great about that. But Sean, what was your experience? Was it different? I don't know. Sean, yeah, we're so only two I, years apart. We often have different perspectives. on Yeah, that. real quick. I just um, because we got a lot of free swag, it, it was uh, it was inundated. So we got a lot of peanut stuff. But when you get to high school, it, at least from my experience, in the 90s, it wasn't so cool anymore. So I sort of. I sort of put it all off to the side, um, but meanwhile, uh, I always had an affinity for the music. When, when Jason was talking about the This Is America series in the 80s, they brought in all these jazz people, the greats, Brubeck, Wynton Marcellus, David Benoit, and it was because the jazz that 
that my dad established with Vince Guaraldi bringing him into the fold in, in the 60s with the original Peanuts specials, um, they, they kept that going. Jazz is synonymous with Peanuts. And so growing up, our dad would play this music for us all the time. I never thought about the significance when I was a child, but I just remember experiencing and feeling, and I grew up a fan of all these great uh, jazz artists. And uh, to, th to that point also, although I was kind of putting it to the side on in, in the 90s when I was in high school, it wasn't until th that my dad was at the end of his life and even after he passed that I sort of took on this sort of epiphany that, wow, I should be really uh, taking this to heart and take great pride in what my father's legacy is. And that kind of happened for me at this stage in my life. Well, and, and one more thing, everywhere we went with our father, even on our own, if you go to any kind of place where they play music, invariably, no matter what time of year it is, somebody's playing Linus and Lucy. I've heard it in Disneyland. I've heard it in Singapore. I've heard it in Thailand, in France. It's a standard now that is played, not even within the context of Peanuts sometimes. And it's a lot of these jazz guys that we know, it's one of the first things they may have learned on the piano. It may be they heard it in TV and said, what's that? And it drew them to that music. So again, in that sort of accessibility thing, there is a whole realm of people who know this music sort of innately. And, you know, for me, I take great, I mean, Sean is the musician, but I love listening to this music and I love living in this music's world. But to have that connection, we're incredibly, incredibly proud of that. And, you know, our father, when they did these shows back in the 60s, it wasn't accidental, but it wasn't incredibly well planned out. The The stories, a lot of people know the stories about Like a Charlie Brown Christmas, but it came out of a failed documentary that never aired. And it was not something that was sort of pre-planned. It was sort of almost done as an emergency to correct what had been going on with the documentary and it was sold to CBS to run. And it's, you know, it's been on the air every year or stream now for free every year since 1965. And the irony is one of the ironies that's so fun about this is when they did the documentary, my father who was in Northern California and Charles Schultz who was in Northern California he was driving across the Golden Gate Bridge and heard Vince Guaraldi's great Cast Your Fate to the Wind. And he loved that and looked him up and he was Northern California. He lived in Marin. And so on his way to meet with Charles Schultz to do the documentary, he heard that music and that's the guy he sought to do the score for the documentary. And so when they then sold Charlie Brown Christmas, which they hadn't even developed or even thought about, but invented on the spot, they of course turned to Vince to do the music. And of course the great irony is the only thing that was released from that original 64 documentary was the impressions of a boy named Charlie Brown by Vince Guaraldi. So the music in effect was the first thing that actually came out from that partnership and then led to Christmas, which now has become the number one Christmas album of all time. Mm -hmm. And so that whole history is again, my father's favorite word was serendipity and all those things sort of work together. And, you know, uh, and that, I mean, I, don't, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I keep going if you want. I, the, the big thing that happened for us here with this music was during the pandemic, we'd been looking for a better source for some of the music from our shows. And I had the main master from the shows, the stems with the music, but it had been pre-mixed and it had been used many times over the last 50 plus years, 55 years. But we went back to the vault because we couldn't do anything. We were all in lockdown. And we found with our partners at Bill Melendez, all these tapes that we didn't realize were the original studio sessions. And so that's how we came up with all this new music was to find, was by finding these, um, the original recording session tapes. And, and the, the irony of it was we'd looked for this for decades. Like it wasn't the first time we looked for this, but we didn't have the same um, ability to find it as we did this time. And the the big the big surprise for Sean and for me was the first one we found was something that said "You're in Love, Charlie Brown," which was the fourth Peanuts animated special, and we thought it was another one of these mixed uh, comp stems for the show. And we'd waited a couple of weeks to get it back from the the transfer house, and the first thing we got was a log, and the log showed ninety minutes. And we said, well, that doesn't make sense. All these shows are 25 minutes. Everything we have is always 25 minutes, 20 or whatever the, the length of the show is. 
And sometimes it's, if it was on 35 millimeter, it would be in three, eight minute segments or something. But, and, and, and tied back to Mark Evanier, I, a few years ago, when we, we remastered all of the Garfield and Friends shows, which Evanier wrote all 121 of, we had gone through and I'd, I'd pieced together from all the 35 millimeter, all those shows, but none of them were contiguous. It wasn't like episode one, two, three, it was all over the place. So I'd gotten pretty good at, at figuring out how to go through film and video and everything, but this was different with the sound. And so Sean and I got this log and I'm like, I don't know what this is, 90 minutes, it doesn't make any sense, this is weird. And then we got the tapes, we got the, the sound files and we heard Bill Melendez talking on them. And we heard John Scott Trotter orchestrating on them. We heard Vince Guaraldi calling out the cues. And all of a sudden we realized, oh my goodness, we have all of these original sessions. And then that became what we did for most of that summer and fall of the, the beginning of the pandemic where we were locked up was just go through the music and catalog it. And the first thing we released was the, the Great Pumpkin album last year through Concord, which is all from those same tapes. And that one, we didn't even find that one. That one was missing even beyond the beginning of this project. And literally I'm on FaceTime with one of my friends at Melendez and it's on the shelf in their office studio. It shouldn't be there. It should have been in the proper storage, but it just happened to be sitting on a shelf who know, maybe for 50 years. I don't know, but that was found. And no, notoriously the great pumpkin soundtrack had the, had audio clips in it, right? Like there were, the, there was a CD release a while back and it had like, the sound cues were in it, right? And so that you didn't have just the pure music. That's why we started to look for all of this because yeah. we, the original release of that was not um, was not what we wanted it to be. So <laughs> we went back and found, that's the reason we looked for this is because we knew there had to be a better source for this. And we were in our wildest dreams. We never thought we'd find what we found because not only did we find the best version and untouched versions of these original recordings. And I want Sean to expand on this. We also found all the stuff from the cutting room floor and where you might think, Oh, that was the, that wasn't as good as the material used in the show. That wasn't always the case back in 66 on some of these, they would record and they needed to hit a minute and three seconds. And maybe they went a minute and eight, but they couldn't think, Oh, we have no way to, there wasn't digital manipulation. This all done analog. There was no way they were going to be using that minute eight, so they did it again, and they did it again, and then they finally had a minute six. But maybe that minute eight's the best version anybody's ever heard, but that was never released or even knew existed. How much remastering was done? Because I'm going to tell you, when I hit play on this, I've heard these songs, I don't even know how many times, right? My whole life, when I hit play, I was like, whoa. I mean, it's like, it's right up there in the front. It's like you're at the front row of a jazz concert or something, but the drums are tight. How much remastering did you guys do on these? The... On for Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, it is from the original studio sessions, and our entire mandate was to take how it would sound on the show, but bring it where it's in the front. It's not underneath the dialogue and effects. We did not mess with anything on the first. How many tracks is it, Sean? For Thanksgiving, the thirteen, first, the first thirteen. So the thirteen tracks on the album are the cues from the show exactly how it is in the show, except you don't hear it buried. It's not monoed underneath mm -hmm. the dialogue and effects. It's in full effect, but we did not manipulate or mess with it in any way on those because our goal is to bring what Garaldi intended from the beginning, but nobody's ever heard it because they didn't have these sources. So it is, it is a, it's a, we, uh, Vincent Hudson did the remastering with us on all of these. And it is, it is wonderful because for those shows, they were recorded in stereo sessions. So it's also never been in stereo, but we didn't manipulate any of that. We took those as purely as they were and put them on the record. The bonus tracks are, had never been heard. So some of those we've featured different instruments on or players on some of those there's, there's, um, a couple where we've added stems that were not used in the show and it wasn't even on those tracks, but they recorded it in that session. So there might be an extra piano or there's a piece where Vince is whistling himself. But for the most part, our, our North star was let people hear Vince as he recorded it in those studios, in this case in 1973, as purely and authentically as, as you can. And we did not mess this stuff up <laughs> in any way. That was our entire point. We didn't loop anything. We didn't, we didn't change anything. We just brought it for Sean. You want to? You look concerned, Sean. You have a difference of opinion on that. Uh, I, I don't exactly know how to 
let's see. So uh, to be clear, yeah, uh, Pumpkin was in mono, untouched, just remastered by Vincent Hudson. Uh, Thanksgiving, because it's stereo, um, we had all, and because we had all the stems we could manipulate, we did our best in stereo to make it as pure as possible. Uh, some, um, and so there are some, there's been previous releases of some of these tracks. We would continuously compare those previous releases of these tracks uh, and they try to do our best to make it better. And like you said, Heath, uh, we want it to be a little bit more forward, a little bit more lively and a little more present. And so I think that's what our, our end goal was with this particular soundtrack. And mm -hmm. Sean always, and one of the reasons we did Thanksgiving sort of first here, or I guess second after Pumpkin, is not only is it's 50th anniversary this year, but Sean, tell them what you observed about the, the mix uh, in the show. Oh yeah, so when you look across the 15 scores that Vince Guaraldi had, uh, I think of all 15 scores, for whatever reason, he, he was muted or dampened down. And so you don't even hear drums and bass on the actual show. I mean, if you do, it's just the light, lightest snare, lightest uh, hi-hat, the bass is barely detectable. So it was exciting because the gentleman that we that we know personally now who played bass and drums on this, you know, they were able to hear things that they've never heard before because they did it live in the studio in 1973. And now they're actually getting to hear it back with what would sound like a trio in a jazz club, hopefully. What comes out is it's the East Bay sound, which I'm not, I tell, talk to me a little bit about the East Bay sound because it's funky, man. So I'm, I'm super excited about this because Again, the other thing that sets this show apart from the rest is Mike Clark. Mike Clark had already toured with Garaldi in the late 60s, and he brought in, uh, along with the gentleman David Garibaldi, the drummer from Tower of Power, sort of the origins of funk music. And, and basically the patterns, the breakbeat patterns, if you will, they call it popcorning on the hi-hat. And Vince wanted that youthful sound. Vince was 47, 45 or mid 40s when he recorded Thanksgiving, it might be early 40s. And these guys, my, uh, Mike Clark on drums and Seward McCain on bass, were both in their early 20s or mid 20s. And so he loved having the youthful vibe. He embraced change. He embraced that rock and roll was becoming the mainstay in the in the in the late 60s, going to the 70s. And he was in a jazz fusion. And Seward McCain, the bassist, uh, he was asked to play electric bass. And so that, in combination with Mike Clark's uh, funky stuff. You hear it in the studio and even on this that track called Clark and Giraldi, it's it's very much specifically that sound coming out of the East Bay and the Bay Area. I love all the clavicle stuff and in your liner notes, which are excellent, by the way. Great oh, liner you. notes. I really appreciate that, Heath. That's really yeah, cool. no, you know what you're talking about. And you're like you connect, like you, you bring up Stevie Wonder and like what's going on there. And it, yeah. it does have this, it's got this very distinct, funky, alive, vibrant sound. And it's and like in some ways it's a shame that you don't really get to hear them in the special, but then it, it totally would have changed the special, right? I mean, like it would have it would have been a lot funkier for sure. But um it's it's given it new life. And so I don't know, it's almost like it's almost like we have a new a new recording, but it's not new. It was there all along, which is why I'm so amazed by all of this. <laughs> that's it, man. That's exactly that's how I that's exactly how I felt when I first Jason and I first heard it. You're in love and all these soundtracks. This stuff is and it's not background music most of the specials i would say are melodic accessible front forward melodies that he he perfectly bridged what was pop sensible melodies with a jazz harmonious thing and and it's you're absolutely right it's like oh there's this drum pattern and that's why we love on the bonus tracks you hear in the studio that thanksgiving interlude it's like a 30 second interlude and you hear them go from the standard traditional jazz swing all the way up to what ended up being the show, which was a funkier East Bay sound thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so cool that hearing the stories from Mike Clark, how Vince kept saying, yeah, yeah, more of that East Bay, East Bay sound. We got to do that while they're in the studio. So it's neat. And what what's so great and what's been so um, fun about this for, for Sean and for me has been Garaldi was this great genius musician and a great genius composer. And he wrote that Christmas music, which is the most, I mean, there's like 25,000 covers of Christmas time is here. And, and the album is, it, it's doing better than ever. It's like been on the billboards top, whatever the last several years, every year. And that music he wrote, it's waltz. It's not Christmas, but it's become the Christmas music, right? A lot of his music has become so 
heard and understood. And it's there's again, there's very few lyrics on these songs. The, the, I, the, one of the great things on Thanksgiving is you get Little Birdie, which is Vince singing. Nobody knows it's Vince singing. It's on the show, but nobody knows that. He only sang two songs that he in this in his whole. I mean, for Peanuts, it's Joe Cool, which is was in You're Not Elected, and in uh, No Time for Love, and then um, Little Birdie here for Woodstock, who's introduced in the show. He was great at it. He only did it twice. He did these 15 shows, you know, when he did the soundtrack with Rod McEwen for the a boy named Charlie Brown, which I think is on the wall here somewhere poster for the, the first Peanuts feature film. They were nominated for an Oscar for sound score. They lost to the Beatles. I mean, but they never, you know, it was just, it was on TV and they did their thing and he passed so young. But our hope is that we bring this music back to people where they can hear how great it was both in its time and how great it still is. And that's what makes this so fun is all of this music is a tale of that time too. In 65, you get his, his early jazz tied into this waltz and there's a Latin thing going on. And as it evolves into the six, late sixties, he gets more comfortable with the cues for these characters and giving them voice. And in the seventies, he, like Sean said, he starts getting into more experimental stuff and synthesizers. He brings in younger players to learn from what's going on in the Bay area in that period of time when music is not jazz and changing directions. And what does he take from that? And that evolves all the way through it's Arbor day, which is the last show he scored where he's doing even more experimental things. So what'll be fun when this is done is letting people hear all this stuff that they've heard. Cause it's been on TV for 50 plus years, but now they're going to hear this music without those other things going on and take from that what they will. But some of these songs, I mean, I, I was always partial to peppermint patty which is a cue he wrote for that character. I wonder going why. Maybe he you voice, voiced her. Well, that, I don't know. I mean, that might be the bias because I did voice oh, her, but I also just think it's a great song. And Sean discovered as we went through this, that was the most used composition once he did that after Linus and Lucy across all those shows. But I don't think people know that the song Peppermint Patty, they would if they heard it, but it's not something they're familiar with. And it's great in this show. He just does a little touch of it in here. We put a bonus of it in here too. But Again, he wrote all this great music. He did it every year. The, the, the four, we, we talk about the four, not the four horsemen, but the four gentlemen that worked on this. Charles Schultz was such a great philosopher and cartoonist and person and business person too, that whatever he did was left untouched. So his power of his strip, let these shows be made where they didn't mess with our father as the producer they, Bill Melendez animated, did whatever he wanted to do with these characters and made them come to life. And Vince Guaraldi got to do whatever he wanted to do with the music because the four of them worked so well together for their whole careers that there was never any, I mean, I'm sure they had some friction, but at least the family history is that they always worked together and had the freedom to do what they wanted. So Vince did all of this music that came out of his soul to create these pieces for these characters and these stories. And it is beautiful. And it's, you know, ubiquitous and timeless so at least that's what we think and that's why we're trying to get this music out there <laughs> well, i i agree with you one of the great things you can hear on the soundtrack is and i think it's on thanksgiving but it'll be on another one we release if it's not is sometimes i heard vince talking on the piano mic where he's saying something about the song where he's like play it this way or do something and i'm like oh we got to be able to edit that out right and you can't because that's on the piano mic and I realized, oh, well, how did it get on the show? And you go and listen to the show and you turn it up and you go, oh, it's on the show. All of that stuff is still in the show. It's just in the mix or it's under dialogue where you don't hear it. But part of what made this so special is things that we've heard that might have been, maybe they're even mistakes or they're just variations or there's a change in rhythm that maybe not intentional. You go, oh, well, that, that can't be right. You go, no, that was on the show. And because it's jazz, it works because it's organic and it's living and it's moving. And so part of the fun of this was we hear something go, that wasn't how I remember that song. And then you go back, oh, that is how it is. That's how it is on the special. But you didn't hear it for whatever reason until it was isolated in the music alone. So part of that, of the joy of this is hearing all that and realizing how fantastic and real and unmanipulated it is. I mean, it's all live performed by these great musicians and gives life to these characters and to these shows. So that part was great. I wanted to share that too. <laughs> what, is there anything left in the vaults after this? You know, I, there's, you talk about the discovering these tapes. Is there a possibility for any, I don't know what form it would take, but is there anything left after this? Oh, yes. Okay. My hope, the, the first plan is 
we tried to find all of the um all of the tv shows original sessions and we haven't found all of them but we have many of them so the hope is to release soundtrack albums like this there's also other music in the vaults that we're going to go to vince garaldi scored a bunch of our father's documentaries our father was best known for producing the peanut specials and the garfield specials but his his main gig was he did documentaries two or three every year network specials um and some of those were scored by garaldi as well so we're trying to just piece as much of this together as we can. And then again, as, as these things get out there and become hopefully appreciated by people, we can do more of them. But but again, it's like everything else. For the 99% of stuff we found, there's the 1% we're still trying to find that might be missing. And that's sort of an ongoing process. And from my perspective, the best is yet to come, musically speaking. All right. That's a good note to leave it on. I want to thank you guys so much for talking to me about this. I hope when there's more news for some other project, you'll come back and talk to me about that too. I would love, love to do. Thank you. So I'm going to put links in the description of this uh, episode so people can just click straight through, buy the soundtrack, CD, vinyl, digital. I mean, any way you want to get your music, it's there. And it is a revelation for fans of this special, for fans of Vince Guaraldi. It really is a revelation. Gentlemen, well done. Thank you so much. Keith, it's been a pleasure, and I appreciate you being a fan of this music, and uh, thank you for your time. And of Peanuts in general, thank you. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Don't you just want to go listen to some of this music? The, the downside of like podcasts and YouTube and the places that I will put this episode is that I don't have liberty or permission to put some of those songs into the episode so I could be like, oh, let's hear 15 seconds of Little Birdie so we can hear Guaraldi. We didn't know it was Guaraldi singing that song. So we can hear Guaraldi. And here's an alternate take where he whistles instead of sings. He, he accompanies the guitar and the piano by whistling. Stuff we've never heard before. And I can't do that. That's, I don't have, there's no license for me to do that. Even if I have permission, I think YouTube would shut it down. Uh, it is such a cool soundtrack, and you see how excited I get about this, because this, I mean, I, I watch these specials every single year, usually twice. I usually watch the, the Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas specials twice every year. I'll watch them at the beginning of the month to kind of get myself in the mood, and then I watch them on the night of the holiday. So I watch, you know, I've seen these specials dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of times over the span of my lifetime. And... I know this music, right? So that's what's so exciting about this new soundtrack for me is that something that I've known my whole life, like there's more of it and it sounds way cooler than I ever knew it could sound. And you, I mean, you heard, right? You saw the interview, you heard the interview that like, sounds cooler than they thought it could sound too. When they discovered this stuff, it was a mind blowing moment. So what can you do? You can support this soundtrack. You can get it on whatever format. You want to pick it up on you could get the vinyl or the record as we called it back in the day you get the record you can get the uh, the cd soundtrack you can get the digital i will note that the vinyl soundtrack has every single track that's on the cd and the digital version sometimes vinyl versions have less because it's a limited there's only so many minutes you can put on a record right uh, but the everything's here it's complete everything that's on the other versions are on the vinyl including all of the alternate takes all of the uh the variations it's it's great. I cannot recommend this to you guys enough. So support it. That's what you can do. You can support this release and that votes for more stuff like this to come because we know like it sounds like maybe there's maybe more stuff that was discovered that we could get to hear at some point. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, fingers crossed and knock on wood. Here's what else you can do to support Serial at Midnight is you can engage with this. However, you're if you're listening to this in a podcast form, you can do the uh, you can review us on iTunes or wherever else you are catching this podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can do thumbs ups. You can engage in the comments. You can like, you, you can subscribe. Subscribe everywhere. Subscribe on uh, the audio feed and on the video feed. That encourages basically visibility. Uh, and I wanna thank you for doing that. And you can also support Serial at Midnight in other ways. There are YouTube memberships, there's Patreon support. Anything that you can do to support Serial at Midnight, uh, I would really appreciate it. It's so hard to get noticed. And with something like this, which is a really big deal interview, I want as many people as possible to see it. I don't want this to be a secret. I want this to be everywhere because this is awesome. Uh, and you guys are awesome too. So thanks for being here. I got so many 
listen, I'm doing two and three interviews a week right now. There is, this is a hot time for, for interviews that I'm they're They're coming left and right. So stay tuned. There's a lot of stuff that's going to be hitting over the next few weeks, the coming weeks, the coming months. Uh, just let's, let's enjoy it. This is such a great time to be a fan of things. So I appreciate you. Take care till next time. I will catch you later.